Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. You to uh, the first of the ICC series for 2011. Um, this is an honor, of course, to have all of you with us. Um, and of course, to have Dr. O'Donnell is going to be fantastic. He's going to give you a terrific talk this evening on St. Matthew. Uh, it, there is uh, an occupational hazard for priests when we go to funerals. Afterwards, we uh, tend to get hugged. And uh, uh, Max Factor number four winds up on our priest vest and collar. So uh, it's, it'll, it'll wind up in the uh, dry cleaner. So if, I don't want you to think I've become like a renegade or something. I'm not wearing my. <laughs> My colleague here this evening, you know, so. But anyway, um, one of the things that a lot of you will remember is uh, our Holy Father, Pope John Paul II of Happy Memory, spoke to us uh, many years ago of two things, and that was the new evangelization and the new springtime of the church. And if you stop and think about it, the, the new evangelization in a certain sense is the horizontal bar of the cross. The idea of all of us having a moral responsibility as Catholics to go out and tell people about Jesus and the salvation that he offers us. And these are people who have heard of Jesus, but really have never made the commitment, whatever. The new springtime of the church, on the other hand, is the vertical beam, and that's reserved for Catholics. And what John Paul was re referring to in that was the idea that as Catholics, we have an obligation to continually update our knowledge of the faith, to stay young, to stay fresh, to be able to be apologists of the faith. And I, I am absolutely confident that all of you who are here this evening are the vanguard of that uh, new springtime of the church. So to have that kind of educational and intellectual formation at the hands of this fine young gentleman over here on the right, I think is going to be a real indicator. Not at all, Timothy, not at all. And then uh, finally, I'd like to welcome our brother priests who are with us from Holy Transfiguration. Father, thank you so much for being with us this evening. So let's go ahead and begin now with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. God, our Heavenly Father, we glorify and we praise you for this most recent Christmas season which we celebrated, and now we thank you for welcoming us and bringing us into the new year of 2011. As we begin this evening, in which we study in some detail the Gospel of St. Matthew and how he was able to expound upon us the importance of Christ as the Son of God, please send the Holy Spirit upon us so that everything that we say and do will give you great honor and glory to Christ our Lord. Amen. At this point, Sabatino. Thank you, Father. We are on a mission, as Father Moretti said, to evangelize the world. And I look forward to, to a year of challenges and a year of growth for the Institute of Catholic Culture. And so I ask you, please, hold up your Bibles, Catholics. Hold them up in the air if you brought a Bible with you. Look at that. All right. How many times do you see that many Bibles in the hands of Catholics? Don't let anybody ever tell you that Catholics don't keep their Bibles on them. And if you don't keep it on you on a regular basis, start doing it. You've got to have your Bible on you to be able to give a reasoned answer for the faith. Take it to the grocery store with you. Um, wherever you go, have your Bible handy. Our speaker tonight is the first layman to receive both his licentiate and doctoral degrees in ascetical and mystical theology from the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas, the Angelicum, in Rome. Dr. O'Donnell has taught at St. John's Seminary in Camarillo, California, and at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. He is a Knight Grand Cross in the Knights of the Holy Sepulchre, and he is a consultor to the Pontifical Council for the Family. He's written a number of books and has been on a number of EWTN shows, but more importantly than all of that, he's a faithful Catholic historian and theologian. Please welcome Dr. Timothy O'Donnell. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sabatino. My father would have really enjoyed that introduction. My mother would have believed it. All right. <laughs> It's, uh, it's great to be with you all. It's always wonderful to be here at the Institute with the, these wonderful programs. We have a chance to uh, examine God's Word together. And uh, we began with a prayer, but today is the Feast of St. Hilary. Some of you know that. 
So we should all say a prayer for Hillary Clinton. Anyway, <laughs> but this Hillary was a guy. And uh, there's a little passage in the bravery I thought I might start with is for reflection purposes. Is that okay with everybody? All right. The almighty and most holy word of the Father pervades the whole of reality everywhere, unfolding his power and shining on all things visible and invisible. He sustains it all, binds it together in himself. He leaves nothing devoid of his power, but gives life and keeps it in being throughout all of creation and in each individual creature. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. In the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. The Gospel of St. Matthew. A lot to say about that, and we will jump into the text, but I think Sabatino would shoot me if I didn't give you an overview, because, you know, you're never able to cover everything you want to cover, right? So at least if I do an overview, I have less guilt. <laughs> and I know guilt is a Catholic thing, and so you're all into that, you know. We're born guilty, guilty in the womb, guilty in sins did my mother conceive me. I always wonder what did that mean. Anyway, all right. Don't think about it too much. But it is important, it is so important that we spend time with Scripture. And I am delighted that you've brought your Bibles uh, and that you begin the practice. And if we achieve nothing else uh, this evening over the next couple of days, but if we achieve nothing else but awaking and desiring you to read the Scripture prayerfully, and I mean read it prayerfully, not after the latest biblical exegete has taken his scissors and sort of ripped the text when the Jesus seminar comes up with the conclusion that the only thing that Jesus really said in the Our Father is our. You know, you're laughing, but you know what? That's pretty much what they came to. Um, but you need to pray spiritually. As St. Jerome said, remember, ignorance of Scripture is ignorance of Christ. And we love Christ. He's the center of our life. He is the most important thing. That's why I couldn't help but even reflect, I know, the tragedy in Arizona, how, how sad that really is and how we need to pray. And it just grieves me to no end that all we can do is be silent. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, we should be praying the most important reality. The federal judge, by the way, who had just gone to Mass first Saturday, what a great and beautiful thing that was. But we, there's the, I mean, there is really sort of a Christophobia we're dealing with here today, a fear of Christ or bringing him out. And it's the, it's the great elephant in the room. I mean, Christ is real. Our faith is real. And we have to be willing to manifest that publicly in the arena. So I want to commend you for your interest in this area. Ignorance of Scripture is ignorance of Christ. These Gospels, in a very real, concrete sense, as Fulton Sheen used to say, are his love letters. And if we really love him, we want to spend time with him. And one of the best ways we can spend time with him is with his word, where he speaks to us. You know, so many times in our spiritual life, the thing we get most frustrated with is, oh, if I could only ever hear God. Now, if you hear him, I don't want to know about it. But anyway, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You want to hear God. All right? And so many times in our spiritual life, the problem is we're doing all the talking. Isn't that true? Even in our masses and our liturgy, God is there. He's present eucharistically. But often there isn't much time for silence. We're always talking. And we find God in silence and we find him in his word. So I would strongly urge you, long after this series is over, that you take time with the gospel and you read it prayerfully. Make a resolution to read a little bit every day. Uh, and that doesn't mean you have to read a chapter every day, because then you get hyper, I've got to get my chapter in. And zzz, 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 zzz. Put yourself in the presence of the Holy Spirit and let him speak to you. And if as you're reading something touches you, something hit, hits you with a particular poignancy, suffer the little children to come unto me and hinder them not. You know, Stop your reading and run with it. And let that verse fill you you know, because so many times we're in a rush, we've got to do my spiritual, re you know. Take the time. If all you do is three verses, that's great. When you find that you've exhausted the thought and then you're starting to get distracted, then continue the reading. But don't race through it. Everything in this book is inspired by God. 
And even though it was inspired 2,000 years ago, he who inspired them 2,000 years ago had you and me in mind today. And it's an amazing thing to think from all eternity, God knew that today, this date in January 2011, that you would be here and you would be looking at this text. So don't deny that personless dimension that is there. Let him speak to you. Now, the Gospel of Matthew, I would submit, is probably the most loved of all the Gospels. I know a lot of people would say, oh, John, you know, and I love John too, but all of them are great. But whenever there's a quotation of a teaching of Jesus or something, so many times we come back to Matthew. Now, maybe it's because he's the first one, all right, in the New Testament. When you pick him and say, I'm going to read the New Testament, you open up, and where does everybody start? You start with Matthew. But it is so complete, it is so beautiful. And there is such a Semitic tone and flavor to this that as you read this, it's very easy to feel close to our Lord as he's walking the hills and the fields of Palestine. And uh, it is truly beautiful, and it comes through that way. Now, the author, Catholic, we don't want to get into all this sort of the debates going back and forth. Catholic tradition has been unanimous that the Apostle Matthew is the author of this gospel. And there's numerous testimonies that we have to that. Ignatius of Antioch, Polycarp, Justin Martyr, Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, all of them say it was the Apostle Matthew. And many of them are writing in different geographical locations, come out of different cultural backgrounds, but there is a universal testimony that he is the author of this particular gospel. And there are many things that point to that as being true. And, uh, of course, we know that he was a resident of Capernaum, that he was a tax collector, a publican, who was called to be one of the twelve. And what I love about Matthew is when he got his call, you know what he did? Threw a party. The Gospel tells us he threw a party, invited all of his friends, and sinners can be good people to party with, you know. Until after the second drink, then you've got to get out. But anyway, you, you know what? Okay, you have a sense of humor. If you don't, this is going to be a very long night. All right. <laughs> Remember, it's not a sin to laugh at what I just said. But if you take pleasure in it, it could be. But anyway, <laughs> so be careful. Be careful. All right. So he had another name where he, refer, he was also referred to as Levi. Matthew and Levi are the same uh, individual. And he's called Matthew in the list of the different apostles. It's very interesting. In his own gospel, you know what he calls himself? He calls himself Matthew the Publican. Isn't that beautiful? No one else calls him the Publican, but he calls himself, refers to himself as the Publican. Now, the original language. This is probably the only book in the New Testament that was not originally written in Greek. This book was written in Hebrew, probably in Aramaic. The only one. Everything else was written originally in the Greek language. And uh, it was probably the type of Palestinian Aramaic that Paul spoke when Paul was being arrested near the temple and he stood up and spoke extemporaneously to the Hebrews. So there are traces, even in the Greek, of this Aramaic original. Certain words that sort of pop in there and jump out at you, like raka, the Aramaic word for fool, mamona, the word for mammon is still in the Greek text in the Aramaic form. Corbona, all of the little, little Aramaic terms that are still preserved which show the original language of the gospel. Even in a very important passage that we'll probably get to next week where Matthew makes his great profession of faith and Matthew is called Simon Bar-Yona. Bar -Yona. The Aramaic is preserved in that passage which is very important for us. Why? Because it reminds us that when Jesus was speaking to Peter, he was speaking in Aramaic, not Greek. And that's why his name is Kephos, the rock. Because sometimes we get into this Petros, Petra thing. Okay, well, well, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But anyway, scripture scholars used to cite the Aramaic Matthew as probably being written around 42. Now, for a lot of modern scripture scholars, this seems very, very early. But that was very common. Now, notice how close that is to the time of our Lord. And then there was a Greek translation that was done of that original Aramaic 
gospel. We don't know who did the Greek. We have to confess our ignorance. Jerome in his day said, we don't know who translated into the Greek. What we do know is the Greek Matthew was universally accepted everywhere throughout the church. The fathers of the church quoted, everyone accepted the Greek Matthew as authentic. As a matter of fact, at the time of the Renaissance, Leo X, the Medici Pope, I don't know if you do, okay, not the best guy in the world, but, you know, he, he did a good liturgy. Um, <laughs> but anyway, he gave a huge award to any scholar who could find the original Aramaic Matthew, and they ransacked libraries all over Europe trying to find it, never were able to find it. So all we have is the Greek. Nevertheless, it's very, very interesting. There's a French scholar by the name of Claude Tresmontan who took the Greek Matthew and translated it back into Aramaic. And you know what he found? It went beautifully. There was poetry, there was rhyme, there was meat, there was also... It went so beautifully back into Aramaic that he became absolutely convinced. We actually published this book at Christendom Press. It wasn't a big seller, I'll tell you that. But it was originally published in France, because who's going to read, you know? But it's sort of weird looking at it and seeing almost the gospel with new eyes. But it was really beautiful. And he was absolutely convinced when you went back. He said, this is definitely a Greek rendering of an Aramaic text. And, of course, some other interesting things that we have found, because a lot of modern scripture scholars would say, oh, Matthew's gospel, it has to be after the destruction of the temple. But that was never the opinion of antiquity. It certainly wasn't of biblical exegetes prior to around 1965. Many of them said, no, this would have been done in the 60s. And there has been some interesting work that has been done just recently, not by scripture scholars, but by historians and people who are very good at doing analysis of scripts and types of writing where they actually have a fragment. Magdalen College in Oxford, where C.S. Lewis was, they have fragments that was found of papyra found in Egypt of Matthew's Gospel, fragments from chapter 23 that has a particular style of writing, particular style of penmanship. Now, what's very exciting about this discovery, got some press, but not as much as it should have, that when they found this papyri, it was with a, a box of other papyri, indicating that they came from the same source, same place, same time. And in, along with these fragments of papyri that they have, they also found other fragments describing business transaction involving the sale of like seven goats, where this guy wanted seven more goats and he had to get permission from the city magistrate. But what was very significant, the city magistrate, who was a Roman official, gave permission for the transaction and dated it and actually mentioned the reign of the emperor Nero. Now, it's the same type of lettering, the same type of structure. And so a number of historians, including Jewish scholars in Jerusalem, have come to say, this text that we have of Matthew in Greek definitely is 65 or 66. That's before Peter and Paul died. Now, not as a theologian, but as a historian, do you realize what that means in terms of the authenticity of this text? Its closeness, its proximity to the time of our Lord. Very, very important, very significant for us uh, indeed. Now, who was he writing for? Most scholars will say it's very clear that he was writing for his fellow countrymen. He was writing for a Jewish audience. And there are a number of reasons why this is the case. When it comes to Jewish customs, such as washings and things like that, he never gives an explanation, he just talks about it. Whereas when you go to Mark or Luke, they give explanation. You see, the Jews used to take cups and would wash them. He doesn't explain anything even in terms of geography, when he's talking about Arimathea or Emos or any, any town or anything like that, he never describes where it is. The presumption is you know where that is, whereas Luke and Mark and others give you descriptions where it is. Furthermore, when speaking of Jerusalem, he calls Jerusalem the holy city, which is something that a Jew, how a Jew at that time would refer. So all of these things point to that. Furthermore, if, you, if you've started, how many have started reading a little bit of Matthew before tonight? Anybody? Okay, some of you. Okay. Do you notice how many times it says, this fulfills what was spoken by the prophet? 
Okay, the constant reference to the Old Testament, constant reference to fulfillment of prophecy. There are 70 citations of the Old Testament in the Gospel of Matthew. 70 times Matthew quotes the Old Testament. In Mark, Luke, and John combined, there are 50. Okay, just to give you a sense of proportion. So clearly this is something very much on his mind. So what is its purpose? The purpose of the gospel. It is an apologia. He is defending Christianity. We could almost say this is one of the first apologias, maybe the first apologia for Christianity. He wants to show what? Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ. He is the Christ who was foretold by the Old Testament. And everything, his birth, his infancy, all of the things that we find in the gospel are meant to prove that, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah who was foretold in the Old Testament. Another thing that reveals this sort of interest in a Jewish or a Hebrew audience, and Papias, one of the earliest testimonies, says he wrote it in Hebrew for his fellow countrymen. So that's been the constant tradition, and the text itself supports that. But in addition to this, he really communicates that the new law that is promulgated by Jesus does not abolish the old law, but fulfills. It perfects. It brings it to perfection. So a real sensitivity to not destroying the old law, but fulfilling it and perfecting it in Christ. So the interpretation of that law is no longer the scribes and the Pharisees. It is Christ who promulgates the new law particularly in the great moment in the Sermon on the Mount, which we'll probably get to uh, next week. Another thing that he really wants to focus on, the passion narrative in Matthew is very rich, very full, and very complete, filled with details. In many ways, it sort of leads you to the culmination of this gospel. When that centurion looks up and says, truly, this man was the Son of God. All right? It's a great moment. All right, Jesus as the Messiah, his sufferings and death on the cross, which as St. Paul said in his letter to the Corinthians, truly was a stumbling block. All right, Matthew wants to clearly show that this suffering, this passion and death was preordained by God and was foretold in the scriptures, that the Messiah was going to come and give his life as a ransom for the many. And then, of course, the other thing that's particularly important, Matthew is the evangelist of the church. He talks all the time about the kingdom. But the kingdom of God becomes a society that is present on earth. And it finds itself in its fulfillment in the life of the church. Now, if you think it would be helpful, would you like a basic outline of the whole gospel? Would that be helpful to those who are taking notes just to how to break it down? Okay. First of all, you have the prologue and book one, which would be the foundation of the kingdom. So prologue and book one, the foundation of the kingdom, that would be chapter one to chapter two, verse 23. That's your prologue that sort of lays the foundation for the kingdom, because many of the things that happen in the infancy narrative are preparing us for what's to come. Book two, which would be the dynamic of the kingdom, would be from chapter three, to chapter 7, verse 29. Okay, book 3, the mystery of the kingdom that it becomes revealed would be chapter 8 to chapter 11, verse 1. Then book 4, the kingdom becomes the church. That's crucial for us. That's basically chapter 13, verse 54 to chapter 19. And then the final part, book five, would be the passion, death, and resurrection account. And all of that would be lumped from basically 26 to 28. Those are the areas, I've left a couple things out, but those are the areas we're going to try to look at and spend some time on uh, tonight. So, without any further ado, let's open the Bible. Let's take a look at the beginning of this. Now, of course... We start with that horrific reading that we get in Advent. The reading where if you're on the pew, you start hearing this, people start yawning. If you're a lector, you shake in your boots with fear because you've got all of these names that you have to pronounce and everything. But you have to understand for a Jew, 
this is the way to start. You want to understand a man? Tell me about his family. Tell me about his background. Tell me about his ancestors. I mean, the Jews were almost as bad as the Irish are. <laughs> oh, I always knew you were a Kelly. You looked like a Kelly just like your grandfather and your great grandfather. The Kelly's always a bad lot. All right, whatever the case might be. All right. Now, what would be the sources for this genealogy? A lot of this is derived from the Old Testament itself. But there were also public records that were kept in Jerusalem of family trees, not only of the kings, but the different branches of families. And there would have been private documents. Remember, the Jews were very big into their pedigree. All right? Circumcision, the sign of the covenant, the bestowal of the name. All right? The father, the father, the father. This was very, very important to them. So, again, another sign that he's writing for Hebrews. Because if you want to know who this guy is, you want to know who he is descendant from. And so starting with the genealogy would be the most natural way to begin. Even though we look at it and he seems sort of, seems sort of strange to us. But we notice the affirmation that starts right with the very first book. The book of the origin of Jesus Christ. Now remember, Christ is not his last name. All right? He's Jesus bar Joseph. All right? So when they say, the book of the origin of Jesus Christ, they're saying, Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one, this is him. This is the guy you want. This is who you have been waiting for. The anointed one, the chosen one of God. All right? So the book of the origin of Jesus Christ, and then to make it even more explicit, the son of David, the son of Abraham. All right, do you see who he's writing for? To a Roman, that'd be kind of neat, but okay, so what? But to a Jew, wow, he was of Abraham. He was of David. And to the Jew would resonate, he'd go back to the book of Genesis, the very first book in their Bible. Chapter 12, verse 3. In you, Abraham, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And the rabbis knew it was a messianic text. All right? Then Nathan's prophecy to David about the one who was to be born, who would sit on the throne that would not end. So all of this would resonate. Then you go into the begot, the begot. As I tell my students at Christendom, how can you be bored with this? It's begetting. <laughs> Aren't you interested in that? Oh, doctor. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> now, it's in a loose sense that so-and-so was descendant of. It's not super tight. But there's a theological structure that he's using here. And you have 14 generations from Abraham to the exile, another 14 generations, and then another 14 generations. The number 14 is symbolic of David's name. All of the letters in the Hebrew alphabet have a numerical value. D is worth four, V is worth six. So to say, David, it's DVD. Easy to remember, isn't it? DVD, all right? DVD, four, six, four, which totals 14. The whole thing, son of David, son of David, the Messiah, the one who is to come. Now, there's a lot of things hidden in this genealogy that we sort of go through very rapidly and don't pay a lot of attention to, but we probably really should. Because in this genealogy, there are some people who are really good, and there are some people who are really bad. I mean, really bad. Everything you have in here. Now, a couple of things we want to note is the presence of Gentiles in the genealogy. Right? There are Gentiles in it, a lot of Jews, of course. He is Jewish. But there's Gentile blood. Yick! All right? But that's important for his universalist theme, right? Because Christ is coming for the Jews, but is he coming just for the Jews? He's coming for the Jews in order that he might save all, right? That all men might be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. But look at some of the names that we have in here. Like in verse 3, Judas begot Pharaoh's and Zara of Tamar. Remember Tamar? She's the prostitute hanging out at the roadside who he has illicit relations with. Do you notice how many times women are in the genealogy? There's women all throughout this genealogy. So you have Tamar. You have Rahab, taken from the book of Joshua. Remember the one who hid the two Jewish spies? Well, most scriptures call it, say that house they were hanging out at, it was a, a house that was not particularly, well, it wasn't a convent. All right. All right. 
But remember, and that's why a lot of the fathers say that red cord that was hung out, remember, that saved her and her family? It was the blood of Christ, part of the bloodline. Fulton Sheen used to say when he would celebrate Mass and he would elevate the sacred chalice with the blood of Christ. Oftentimes he would think of Rahab and that blood that became part of the precious blood. I mean, the continuity of salvation history, how beautiful it is. So she is mentioned in there. Ruth is mentioned in the genealogy. She's a Moabite. She's not Jewish. All right. And, of course, you have Bathsheba, who was married to the Hittite, remember, who David lusted after. And you've got some really bad kings. But what, so this tells us a lot about Jesus, but Matthew is using the geology, this genealogy to teach us a lot of things. What's he trying to teach us? That Christ really became one with us. He didn't descend from heaven in some super miraculous way we just sort of took his own body. He became incarnate in Mary, in a bloodline, with a history of sin, of guilt, of suffering, of goodness, and evil. And everything that goes into making up our life, he became one with us. And in doing that gives us a great dignity. And of course, in his person, he's going to be reconciling things. Because one of the things he's going to pull together that made Paul freak out, the mystery hidden from ages past, that both Jew and Gentile are called together. So here in the genealogy, you're having Jew and Gentile, normally completely separated, brought together. Being brought together clearly in this genealogy. What else? Male and female. Are women important? Yeah. Now normally they don't get mentioned in a genealogy, but here Matthew mentions that. Normally we talk about Luke's sensitivity, because Luke talks a lot about women. Matthew makes a very specific point of bringing in the women here. And that's very important, that women are mentioned in the genealogy. So Jew-Gentile reconciled. Male-female reconciled. And that's important today with feminism and all this stuff going on that's trying to divide us and pull us apart. We are meant for each other. We complement each other. Thank God we're different. What do the French say? Vive la différence. But yeah, thank goodness. But we are made for each other. So things that drive us apart would try to destroy that complementary nature are not of God. Because Christ brings Jew and Gentile together, he brings male and female together, and he brings saints and sinners together. There are great sinners, horrible kings in here, there are prostitutes, and yet they're all part of what's going to be the incarnation of Christ. So he becomes one with our humanity. Does that make sense to everybody? Now, let's go on to the story. And are you still kind of having a Christmas hangover? I hope you are. Because it's still lingering in the air. You know, they still have the crash in the tree up at St. Peter's until February 2nd. For those of you who are lazy looking for an excuse, say, oh, I follow the Vatican tradition. <laughs> the wreath can stay up till fe- after February 2nd, you're on your own. But they really keep the creches and everything up till the 2nd of February, till Candlemas, which is the traditional date for the blessing of the candles, right? You know that? Because why Christ the light has come now that we bless the candles. Okay, Christmas is over and we really get on with it. All right, so let's go on and take a look at this. Now, the origin of Christ was in this wise. By the way, I'm using a confraternity translation, so there might be some variations with what you have out there, but I really love the translation. When Mary, his mother, had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a couple of things we want to note about all of this. First of all, there are three steps in a Jewish wedding. There is the engagement phase. Engagement oftentimes would happen when you were a kid, all right? You all seen Fiddler on the Roof, right? That I could get stuck for good, all right? So engagement, oftentimes as a child, you would actually be engaged. The betrothal period would be the formal period of an exclusive relationship, lasted normally about a year, so you would have engagement, betrothal, then the marriage proper, all right, where the groom would come to the house of the bride, all right, and the best man, who was St. John, remember that? 
the bridegroom hears the voice of the groom, and he's happy because the best man at that time would stand outside the bride's home, standing guard, to make sure that nobody came in, no one saw the bride until the groom came. That's where we still get that beautiful tradition, don't look at the bride, right? Grooms, the, you, you know, it, well, they still do that some places anyway. All right. Unless you come in late, then you see and you've got to go, oh, we can't look. All right. But that's the beautiful tradition. So the ta- period he's talking about here is the betrothal. They're not living together. That would have been scandalous. You had engagement, betrothal, then the marriage proper. So this is in the betrothal stage. And as a matter of fact, we know that no one ever had relations. This would have been unthinkable in the betrothal stage. If a woman had her husband die during the betrothal period, she was referred to in Jewish literature as a virgin who is a widow. All right? So you don't have relations. She has not moved to live in with Joseph. Now, of course, it is interesting. She was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Who found? Well, Mary probably found herself pregnant, but she had communication. Probably Anna and Jochum found. Joseph probably found. Out. All right. Now, but Joseph, her husband... And I want to spend a little bit of time on this because I think sometimes modern movies don't do justice to, I think, what's going on here. All right? But Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and the word means righteous, good, holy. In the Old Testament tradition, he was a holy man, righteous, being a just man. And not wishing to expose her to reproach, was minded to put her away privately. Now notice... He's just, right? He wants to put her away privately. Why? Because she was found to be with child of the Holy Spirit. Now stick with me for a minute, okay? And while he thought on these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Now, Luke's gospel is the gospel of the Blessed Mother, right? Everything's Marian. It's feminine. It's intuition. She's pondering everything in her heart. She has her enunciation. This gospel is written for Hebrews. It's a man world. This is Joseph's gospel. This is his story. So as you read, you might invoke Joseph to enlighten you and to help you see what's going on here. So, just as Mary had an angel in Luke, so Joseph, although it's a dream, still an angel comes. He has his own annunciation. Now, notice what the angel says. Do not be afraid, Joseph, son of David. Now, you know what that means, don't you? What's that referring to, son of David? When Joseph is given the title son of David means he's got a title, right? He has a special role to play. Because we always looked at a genealogy that talked about son of Abraham, the son of David, right? Do not be afraid, Joseph, son of David, to take thee, Mary, thy wife. For that which is begotten in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she shall bring forth a son. And thou shalt call his name Jesus. Who's bestowing the name? Joseph is. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now, all this came to pass that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled. And then Isaiah's prophecy, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is interpreted God with us. Now that prophecy in Isaiah... The Hebrew word is Alma, which means a young girl and means a virgin. When they translated the Hebrew scripture into Greek, they used the Greek word Parthenos, which means literally virgin. She's a virgin. All right? Now, notice what's going on here. What I think is going on here, and there are some exegetes that would agree with me. A lot of times we go, oh, Mary's the unwood mother, and she just wanted to get rid of him so he wouldn't be stoned, etc., etc., I think what's going on here, she's found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. What I believe is going on here is Joseph, recognizing that she's with child by the Holy Spirit, was to marry her, then decides, I need to step back. I need to step back from this. I should not be part of this. All right? 
and it takes an angelic apparition to come and say, no, you have a role to play. Remember, if Joseph is a just man, a righteous man, a holy man, has he known Mary a long time? Did they know each other? Growing up in the same village, most of the fathers say they're the same clan, that Mary also was of the house of David. All right, most of the fathers of the church say that. All right? They certainly would have known each other. Do you think Joseph really thought that Mary had an affair? The Immaculate Conception? I don't think so. Now, I don't mean this to take away from the humanity of it. But she was so good, and Joseph would have known her. I think, have you ever seen the movie The Song of Bernadette? There's a very powerful scene where Bernadette faints. And then Francois, the young Frenchman, picks up Bernadette Runs and brings her back to his mother's house and sits her down. And she's sort of revived. And the mother hears that Bernadette's happened. And Bernadette's mom runs, panicking through the streets of the city, and comes up and, and finds her sitting there. And she just says, I dragged myself through the streets. I humiliate. And here you are. And she's just ready to strike him. And the, the other, Francois' mother says, don't. It's a child of God. Don't. And then eventually they take her home. But then Francois is sitting there and he's looking at his mother and he says, as long as I live, mother, I'll never forget the look on that girl's face. One ought not to touch a being like that. And I couldn't help but think, that's where the just man was. That's where the righteous Joseph was when he found she was a child with the Holy Spirit. Why the angel then comes and says, Fear not, son of David. And then affirming the conception of the Holy Spirit, but his involvement. He is necessary. Why? He is the son of David. He is to be the father. He is to be the guardian of the virgin. The guardian of the child. The one who is to protect, guard, and nurture. He has a vital role to play. And you, Joseph, will give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Now, when Joseph, so Joseph, this is on verse 24, arising from sleep, did as the angel Lord had commanded him, and took unto him his wife, and he did not know her till she brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Now, a couple other things. What Matthew wants to clearly emphasize here is the virginal conception. That's why he says, he did not know her until he brought forth the firstborn son. Does that make sense to everybody? That doesn't imply that they had children afterwards. And remember, the title firstborn is an honorific title. The firstborn male child that opens the womb is an honorific title. You had to go and redeem that child back at the temple, right? With the offering of turtle doves that Luke mentions. All right? So it does not imply. It's just like making reference in the Old Testament to Michal and said, and she did not have any other children until the day she died. That doesn't mean at 65 she's having a child on her deathbed. All right? <laughs> the closest thing we could come to in English would be, and he never ate apple pie again until the day of his death. That doesn't mean he's snarfing down apple pie after receiving extreme unction. Or last right, anointing. All right? So it doesn't imply. Does that make sense to everybody? So that's what the until. Really emphasizing that this is the divine offspring. That's the point. That's the doctrine that he is communicating there. Now, we go more deeply into history now. That's sort of the intimate, personal Joseph story. We're going to come back again to Joseph. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Bethlehem, which means house of bread, that's what the word means. So Bethlehem means house of bread, and he's placed in a manger. So you have the living bread in a manger where animals feed. I mean, this is just so beautiful. It's so Eucharistic. He's in a manger. Why? He's already offering himself, all right? In the days of King Herod, now every Jew who would read that would know immediately darkness. We've had light. We've had beauty. In the days of King Herod, Herod the Great, dark times. How dark were they? Even Augustus Caesar in Rome who did the census, all right, going back to Luke, knew Herod and said very, very clearly, <laughs> it's safer to be one of Herod's pigs than to be one of his sons, right? Because the pig, at least ritually, you don't touch that. 
Herod was a monster. And what I love, when you approach the scripture historically, you find in so many instances that what is being communicated here in the sacred text fits with everything we know about the other historic characters who are introduced in the text. Okay. Magi came from the east to Jerusalem saying, Where is he that is born the king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. The Magi. We just celebrated Epiphany. Tradition calls them Caspar, Melchior, and Balthazar. But these kings coming from the east, following a star. Now remember, since the time of the Babylonian captivity, there were Jews all over Persia all over ran, all over the east. And everywhere they went, they took their holy books. And there were numerous prophecies about a star. The prophet Micah talked about a star. Balaam, back in the book of Numbers, prophesied about a star rising in Jacob. Isaiah speaks of that. The Psalms speak of it. So when this sudden heavenly manifestation takes place, and of course there's been all sorts of fascinating studies on What was the star? Was it a purely supernatural phenomenon that God sent? And that might very well be the case. But one thing we do know, thanks to the use of computers, the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena has done a lot of research on this, that from about 8 to 2 BC, there was just phenomenal astronomical things going on in the sky. Phenomenal. Now, in an age without electricity in the Middle East, most people slept on the roof. Can you, have you ever been out to the desert where there's really no light? You know what I'm talking about? Or out to sea where there's nothing where you can really see that? Imagine a world with no electricity and what the stars would have meant at that time, especially when there was a great luminous object. Halley's Comet came at that time. There were phenomenal configurations of planets. Those who take a more natural explanation have actually seen the configuration between Jupiter and Venus. You ever seen Venus in the morning, how bright that is? Okay, like 3 to 2 B.C., in the constellation of Leo, the lion of the tribe of Judah, there was this configuration. It would have appeared low on the horizon. So if you're looking from the east, it would have been incredibly bright. Now, the amazing thing, I'm not saying this is the case, but the amazing thing that they found was there's a process that these planets will do, or stars will do, what they call it a loop process, where they move in a particular direction, and then for one day appear to remain stationary, and then start moving back in another direction. Well, this configuration of these two planets would have started to be seen in 3 all the way to 2 BC, and that's probably when Jesus was born, but that's another discussion. 2 BC, we got the date wrong, but not by much. And we can't change it, because what would happen to the Battle of Hastings? So anyway, I mean, that'd be a problem. Columbus, Discovery of America. All right. So anyway, but it's very fascinating, because the star continued to move, and if you're approaching from these, it would have appeared to move further and further and further north. And the day it would have stopped, it would have appeared directly over Bethlehem, if you're looking from the east. And the day that it actually stopped over Bethlehem, guess what day? December 25th. Isn't that weird? Okay, I'm not saying that's the star, but that's just, that's just one conjecture. Could that be it? I mean, if you ever see Venus and Jupiter together in the night sky, Jupiter was just up recently, and it's the closest it'll be in our lifetime, and it was very bright. And if you imagine that united so much that the naked eye could not see them separate, it would have been a phenomenally brilliant object in the east. All right? So, they follow it. They follow it. Now, they come to, they say that we have seen a star in the east and have come to worship him. But when King Herod heard this, he was troubled. And so was all of Jerusalem with him, I bet. He had ten wives. He killed five of them. He had many sons. He killed a large number of his... Any of his sons we thought were a threat to the crown. So when the king is troubled, all Jerusalem is troubled. Herod was so upset at the thought that when he died, that people might not weep at his passing, that he ordered the soldiers to kill the leading men of the city so that there would be tears shed at his funeral. Now, when you read this, and you know this about the man, what we're about to read makes perfectly good sense, and you can see how it would satisfy a historian reading this, in terms of the type of man this guy was. So they're all troubled, and gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born, and they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, of the land of Judah, art by no means least among the princes of Judah, for from thee shall come forth a leader who shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, evil is always secretive, isn't it? It doesn't do things in the open daylight. It does it in the darkness. 
So Herod summoned the Magi secretly and carefully ascertained from them the time when the star had appeared to them. And sending them to Bethlehem, he said, Go and make careful inquiry concerning the child, and when you have found him, bring, him, bring me word that I too may go and worship him. You know what we call that? A lie. <laughs> A lie. Now think about it, though. There's great light in the Christmas story, but there's great darkness, too. Because our Lord said something about Satan. What was he from the very beginning? He was a liar and a murderer from the beginning, right? So when the light comes, the darkness does not like the light. And so Herod is an agent of the devil, no doubt, because he's lying and then he's going to shed blood. He's going to shed innocent blood. The thought that a child might take his throne. And he, of course, is at a very advanced age now, and he's still worried about his throne. Precisely at a time we should be letting go, right? Preparing for what's about to come. But no, the problem is you start grasping more and more. It reveals so much about him and so much about the time we're looking at. Now they, having heard the king, went their way, and behold, the star that they had seen in the east went before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly. Isn't this great? You know, wherever Christ is, there's joy. They rejoice, not just rejoice, but rejoice exceedingly. This is their quest. This is their goal. This is why Christmas still resonates with us so much. Because everyone's on a search. Everyone is on a journey. Everyone wants to know what the meaning and the purpose of their life is. And they saw in this star that there was a king. And notice they say they're not coming just to venerate. They want to adore the king. So whatever the state of their mind is, whatever the state of their faith is, what the Jews with their revelation are going to miss, the Gentiles trying to use their primitive science have come to faith. They want to come to adore. Notice the three reactions to the birth of Christ that we see here. There's the reaction of Herod, which is hatred. There's the reaction of everybody else in Jerusalem, which is indifference, right? They know we're Bethlehem. They know the prophecy. Do any of them go? No, they don't go. Maybe out of human respect, maybe out of fear of the king, but they don't go. And there's the other reaction, that of the three kings who come and adore and love and rejoice. Right? And that is the sign of the true believer, the true faithful. So those three reactions today, that's what it remains. Indifference, hatred, or radiant love. All right? And entering into the house, they found the child with Mary his mother, and falling down, they worshipped him. How beautiful it is that when God comes, he enters into a family. In this day and age, I don't want to get controversial. We can't even agree what marriage is. We can't even agree what a family is. You know, I mean, we've really fallen. And we need to love everybody. I'm all for that. But we have to be clear in our definitions and clear of what reality is and what a family is. And when God chooses to enter his own creation, he enters with a mother and with a father. And so when they come, they enter a house and they find the mother with the child. And falling down, they worshiped him. Opening their treasures, they offer him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they went back to their own country another way. So through these dreams, so again, an angel probably communicating to them. Now the gifts, of course, gold for kingly rule, frankincense, honoring the Lord's divinity, and myrrh for his sacred humanity, anointed for burial, very precious. So these three gifts pointing to the kingly offices that our Lord's going to be occupying. All right, so we go on from there. But when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph. Now this is the second apparition now that Joseph is going to get in a dream, where an angel comes to him. Now notice, you know, sometimes they get frustrated the way Joseph is portrayed in holy cards. You know, he's the old kind of, you know, holding the lantern. What, that's not very scriptural. Sometimes I think they portray him really old to protect Mary's virginity. That's the one thing I really loved in the Nativity story, the portrayal of Joseph in that movie and in Jesus of Nazareth. Young, strong, vigorous, manly, the kind of guy you're going to turn to in a crisis. All right? And that's exactly what happens. Arise, take the child and his mother and flee rapidly. Get out of here. Flee into Egypt and remain there until I tell thee, for Herod will seek the child to destroy him. 
So he arose, Joseph the just, Joseph the obedient, Joseph the man of action. And he took the child and his mother by night and withdrew into Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod that was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled. Out of Egypt I have called my son. So just as Israel in the Old Testament was going to be called out of Egypt led by Moses, so Christ, who in his person is going to be the new Israel, also is going to be called out of Egypt. Now we know there were large Jewish communities in Alexandria, particularly there were over a million Jews living in Alexandria. So Joseph probably went to Alexandria. That's probably the town where the Holy Family would have stayed. He probably had relatives, probably could have found work there. So he goes and he flees off um, to Egypt. And of course there's some beautiful medieval legends that are told about the flight into Egypt. Have you ever heard the legend of Dismas? Okay, where they, on the way, they've fallen with robbers and they were going to rob the Holy Family because they had the gold, the frankincense and the myrrh. And this one young robber stops them and says, no, we cannot rob this family and actually defends the Holy Family. And that ends up being Dismas, the good thief on the cross, all right, who saved them then. And then this day you will be with me in paradise. Another tradition they hid in a cave. I don't know if you remember this, but the, the practice and there was a spider that spun a web outside the cave. And so when Herod's soldiers were searching all over the hills for the child, they saw the spider web in front of the cave and said, well, no one's been in there because the spider web's there. That's where the tradition of hanging tinsel on our Christmas tree comes. You know, the protection of the spider, the, the, the tinsel that was used to protect the family on the flight into Egypt. Beautiful little medieval traditions in a time of faith. But the text itself is so great. So again, Joseph, man of action, takes the family, guarding Mary, guarding Jesus. Now remember, it says, go to Egypt. He still has to get everybody up, has to get everybody, has to pack, has to go and find work. What a great guy Joseph is. Talk about a model for fathers, a model for husbands, all right? He's not a milk toast guy. He's guardian of families, protector of virgins. He's noble, he's good, he's just, he's righteous. And then Herod, seeing that he had been tricked by the Magi, was exceedingly angry. Okay, this is crazy angry, insane, all right? And he sent and slew all the boys in Bethlehem and all its neighborhood who were two years old or under, according to the time that had carefully ascertained from the Magi. Then was fulfilled what was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children, and she would not be comforted because they are no more. So Matthew sees here the fulfillment of that particular prophecy, which was taken in Jeremiah. And it's very interesting because the very next line in that prophecy of Jeremiah, if you go to look it up, it's in chapter 31, the very next thing talks about the new covenant that's going to come. So in the midst of sorrow, out of the suffering of those children is going to come a new covenant. Rest what does it say right after Jeremiah? Restrain your eyes from weeping. Your labor shall have its reward. They shall return from the land of the enemy. This is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my law within them, not on Sinai, but within them and write it upon their hearts, I will be their God and they will be my people. So right in the midst of that sorrow, there's always this beautiful Catholic synthesis of joy and suffering, joy commingling with suffering in the midst of all this difficulty. All right, Herod finally dies. Now the traditional date for Herod's death is normally, most history books will tell you 4 BC, but there's a number of sources that indicate he didn't die in 4, he died in 2 or possibly 1 BC, that that was a copious error. And that's one of the reasons why that really opens up numerous other possibilities for the star and when the Magi would have actually come. And uh, so that's very interesting to know. One of the reasons that is the case is because Josephus mentions at his death and during his funeral there was a total lunar eclipse. There was no total lunar eclipse in 4 BC, but there was one in 1. All right. So it's just interesting to note. So after this, when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. So what apparition is this? Third apparition. Three apparitions from angels coming to Joseph. He's the contact man. All right. Comes to him. All right. Saying, arise and take the child and his mother and go into the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. 
So he arose. He's the man of obedience. So he arose and took the child and his mother and went into the land of Israel. Now notice, this guy is a fetus at ratio guy. He's a faith and reason man. Now notice, he got the message, go back to the land. And where do you think he was probably going to go? Probably back to Bethlehem. That's where he was born. That was the city they were directed to go to. That's where it all took place. But notice what happens. But hearing that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go there. So he hesitates. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew into the region of Galilee, goes back home. And he went and settled down in a town called Nazareth. And there might be filled what was spoken through the prophet, he shall be called a Nazarene. So again, man of action, hesitates, trying to discern God's will, doesn't want to do it, he exercises the prudence, because Archelaus was as bad as his father. He was so bad, the Romans eventually recalled him, stripped him of his title, and banished him to Gaul, and he dies in oblivion in Gaul. But another cutthroat murder. So do you see how Joseph, even with faith, still is exercising his reason and sees Archelaus and says, I don't think I should take my wife and my child back there. It's beautiful. It's really beautiful. So he is the man of action and the man of faith. And they settle in Nazareth. Now, Nazareth was a backwater town, all right? Remember the taunt? A Nazarene. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Even one of his future apostles said that. And yet Nazareth, if you climb up onto the hill, you can have a beautiful view of the blue Mediterranean Sea. You can see the Mediterranean Sea, so you could have seen ships sailing on the ocean. Uh, not only that, Nazareth also was very significant because the great east, the great north-south, if you're going between Egypt and Damascus, the great caravan route would have traveled that way. That was the road that Alexander the Great took. It was the Pompey and his legions marched on that road. Even Napoleon went on that road. I mean, it was a great military road, and it went right by Nazareth. So you would have seen, even though it was sort of distant and removed, you would have seen the world passing by. You know what I'm saying? So it's very interesting to think. We even know that if they were there around the year 7, that there was a Jewish rebellion. And when it was brutally put down, all those Jewish zealots that were part of that rebellion were crucified. And crucifixes went all along that road. And if you're in Nazareth, you would have seen that. So it's sort of poignant to think that our Lord and his mother and his father would have seen, probably did see, what a Roman crucifixion was like. Right? And they knew the Psalms. They knew the Psalms. They prayed the Psalms all the time. They have pierced my hands and my feet. They have numbered all my bones. I am a worm and no man. All right? They prayed that, and they knew that, and they were enlightened with grace. All right. But now we move on into ordinary time. Is that okay? At least tonight we can start that. Let's take a look at chapter 3. And what great figure emerges in chapter 3? John the Baptist. Now in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now John is big news. You have to remember, there has been no prophet in Israel for four centuries. Prophecy has been dead. There are no prophets for 400 years. We think our country's old. Imagine going 400 years without any prophet. And so in their synagogue, what are they doing? They're reading the prophets. There's a sense of the completion of the prophetic text. And they're reading, and they're praying, and they're waiting for it. Now, all of a sudden, this man emerges, looks like Elijah, crying out, repent. Why? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the word he's using in the Greek is metanoia, an interior change. He wants an interior renewal. You have to acknowledge your sinfulness. Because the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and the kingdom of heaven is bringing a savior, someone who can save you from your sin. But if you don't think you have sin, if you think you're righteous, then you're going to miss it. And that's the problem. That's why he's speaking so forcefully. And so this is he who was spoken of through the Isaiah the prophet. This is again Matthew when he said, The voice of one crying in the desert, Make ready the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Straight his paths. But John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather girded about his loins, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then there went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan, and they were baptized him in the Jordan, confessing their sins, acknowledging their sinfulness. Everyone who, whom this message resonates, they know they're sinners, you know. 
One thing about the pagan world, I, I, I'm sometimes amused to say, oh, we're lapsing into paganism. I wish that was true. You know, the pagans knew they were sinners, you know? Today, no one thinks they're sinners. I mean, superficially. I think everyone in their heart really does know, you know, but we don't talk about it. I mean, the Romans knew it. They had the Tarborium where they would slaughter a bullock on a metal grate and they would walk under the grate and let the blood from the slaughtered bullock come all over them because they believed somehow by having blood come over them, they'd be cleansed from their sin. They were kind of right in a way. They didn't get the details right, but they're, <laughs> without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So the importance of repenting, repenting. All right. Now, that's why, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said, brood of vipers who has shown you how to flee from the wrath to come. Bring forth, therefore, fruit befitting repentance. And do not think or say within yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that God is able out of these stones to raise up children to Abraham. See, what you have to remember is <laughs> the Jews did not go, undergo baptism. There was a baptism for proselytes, for Gentiles who wanted to come into Judaism. There was a type of baptism of repentance. But what John is saying, you need to repent. You need metanoia. So the scribes and Pharisees are coming up. They're not submitting to John's baptism. That's for Gentiles. And the reason they don't have to submit is because who do they have? Abraham for their father. And so he says, don't say you have Abraham. God could raise sons to Abraham out of these stones. In other words, what you're looking for, the kingdom of heaven, it's not enough just to be descendant of Abraham. You're going to have to be born again. You're going to have to be born anew. And the only way you're going to do that is to bring forth fruits of repentance, metanoia, change your heart, a real interior change, acknowledging your sin and that you need a savior. Because when the one he's about to talk actually comes, if you recognize you're a sinner, then you'll want the savior. Make sense? Then I think we're, we're out of time. Can we end with a quick glory be? Is that okay? All right, let's end with a prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, amen. St. Matthew. St. Joseph. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bless you. Okay, our usual rules apply for our, our new... Uh, friends here, and a reminder to Dr. O'Donnell, we're going to go a maximum of five minutes, maybe I'll allow seven. So you've got to get all the questions in very quickly. Okay. Uh, we have a maximum of five questions. Your question has to have to deal with the subject matter at hand. So you can't ask questions about Christendom College. Okay? Um, and uh, <laughs> um, it has to have a question mark on the end. You can ask me afterwards. Yeah. If you have to take a breath, it's too long. And don't dare take my microphone away from me. This is my microphone. I get to hold it. Okay. Yes. In light of the theological message that Mashti was trying to convey in the genealogy, are we to take the genealogy literally or no? Um, it depends on what you mean by literally. Are these individuals named the ancestors of Jesus? The answer is yes. Yes, you should. But... Um, there are differences between, and a lot of theologians, St. Jerome and everyone dealt with the problem, but the genealogy in Luke is different. There's points of reference that are the same, dealing with different texts. But you have to understand that when it says so-and-so begot, so-and-so begot, so-and-so, it's taken in the loose sense. It means had a descendant. It's not giving you necessarily father, son, father, son, but they're all truly ancestors of our Lord. So what's going on here is Matthew is selecting from the information this thing because he wants to teach is the son of David, so he's doing the 14, 14, 14 thing. All right? Now there's also other theological reasons for that because the three descendants of one of the kings were cursed, and so he doesn't mention those three because they were meant to, they're cursed. And so it was a spiritual thing where he's showing that he's a faithful Jew in the recounting. So d does that help to understand? In other words, these are all descendants, true descendants of our Lord, but the word begot means in a loose sense had a descendant. Some are immediate, all right, like David and Solomon, but there would be other spaces in there. 
It is a theological construct, but it's grounded in reality. All of these people are truly <laughs> descendants of our Lord. Good question. Yes. Uh, Jesus and Joseph are both called son of David. Is there a significance to that title, or does that apply to any other individuals in Scripture? Well, certainly it applies to Solomon and, and the kings that also were sons of David. But because of Nathan's prophecy about the eternal throne, that they're, and they recognized the prophecy eventually as referring to the Messiah who was to come. It's what we call a multiple fulfillment pattern in prophecy, where the prophecy was immediately fulfilled in the birth of Solomon, but will be filled more fully and more completely when you get Jesus Christ. So the emphasis, son of David, is clearly, at the time of the Lord, a messianic title. When Joseph is addressed as son of David, it's emphasizing that Joseph, as the legal guardian, will be bestowing his name and legally... He makes Jesus, even though Jesus is also biologically, but even in Joseph's role as a father, he is the one who bestows the legal title upon him and makes him son of David. Is this not the son of the carpenter? All right, which was remembered. And that's why one of the great signs that it was recognized as a messianic title is you remember the blind men at Jericho who start screaming out with almost an animalistic type scream, Jesus, son of David! When they call him son of David, they say, stop, stop, because they realize that's messianic. But he lets them say it, and he works the miracle because he's leaving Jericho to Jerusalem for Palm Sunday. And the time has come where the, I'll let the stone shout it out. So, okay, thank you. It's a good question. Yes, I generally understood that the gospel of uh, Matthew was based upon that of Mark. And if uh, Matthew was written around 42 A.D., as you mentioned, Mark must have been very early. Well, the, well the, tra the tradition is some modern exegetes no longer accept this. A lot of them think Mark came first because they say Mark is more primitive and more rough on the edges. But um, that has never been all of Catholic tradition going all the way back to the apostolic fathers who said this was the order, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the tradition also was that Mark was based upon Peter's preaching in Rome. And the thing is, if you look at... Peter's homily, for example, in Acts of the Apostles, there are several times where Peter gets up and gives a homily. It is a perfect outline of Mark's gospel. The thing is, the gospels come out of an oral proclamation, the kerygma. There was this proclamation of the gospel that was sort of common teaching. So there are common themes that are brought. In other words, in the first decade of Christianity, if you wanted to become a Christian, no one said, sit down and read this book. They brought you in and you were catechized. You were told about Jesus. There was a body, there was a corpus of what Jesus said, what he did, what was taught. And the catechist catechized you. Then at Easter Vigil you would receive baptism. That's the way it was done. Then eventually as we begin to move into time, eventually these things will be written down. So traditionally, Matthew comes first. And this can be debated back and forth, and there's no absolute Catholic position on this. I tend to side with the tradition uh, because I find some of the arguments saying that Mark had to come earlier really to be specious. It looks very much like if you had a Hebrew fisherman preaching and proclaiming the gospel that's what you would have. All right. That's sort of a short answer. But. Thank you very much, Dr. O'Donnell. Is that it? That's it. Oh you're, you're done. Do you have any homework for the people? Oh, well, we want, we, if you, for next week, we really want to launch into the kingdom. So to any, to any references to the kingdom of God, I'm going to try to go through like another probably eight chapters, eight or nine chapters next week. We'll really be focusing on the kingdom and the ministry. If you want to think of like the third luminous mystery, that's what we're going to be doing next week. So proclamation, so go over that, and hopefully we'll have some good questions and good discussion on that. Thank you very much. Okay. Just, just one word before you stand up. I just, as I said earlier about, about sharing your faith with others, that theme of salt of the earth, which Matthew mentions here, I think it's in chapter five, I was just reading it this afternoon, uh, where he says, if the salt has lost its flavor... What good is it but to be trodden underfoot by men? Okay, and we are to be the salt of the earth. There was about 200 people here tonight, as I counted. And I'd like to ask you, how many of you have ever attended a Catholic Bible study with 200 people in attendance? And I would encourage you as you go out tomorrow, whether it be to your job, whether it be to the grocery store or the coffee house, and the person says, how are you? Say, I'm exhausted. Well, why? I was at a Bible study late last night with 200 people and wine and cheese to boot. And 
So, listen, be the salt of the earth. It's easy. You share one thing that Dr. O'Donnell shared that you thought was interesting, and you start a conversation. And let me tell you, 200 people can make a difference in this little northern part of Virginia here, and by extension, throughout the whole world. May God bless you. We'll see you next Thursday. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.